Great, thanks. Thanks, Vicki. Um, and uh, I'd like to start by thanking the ISC and Vicki for reaching out and give us the opportunity to uh, to present to you all um, about uh, our, our use cases for vinyl DNS. Um, this talk uh, follows along loosely with the uh, open source article that was uh, released in August. The link that you can see on your screen here um, talks talks about uh, you know the background and, and why we built what we built, and also kind of like uh, you know how we're using vinyl DNS today. Um, but uh, this isn't going to be a slide that's just going to regurgitate that material. Uh, that wouldn't be any fun for anybody. We'd like to also show several demos along the way that highlight uh, several of the key features uh, that we developed uh, as part of uh, Vital DNS. So high level overview. Um, we'll give a brief intro, uh, a 50,000 foot level. Um, I know uh, Vicky kind of already introduced this, so that'll probably be pretty brief. Um, give a background on the, the state of the world uh, before Vital DNS. Uh, and, and the challenges that we faced at that time uh, that, that led to the rise of vinyl DNS. And then really uh, this, uh, the fourth and fifth bullet point right there in this talk, we'll, we'll kind of jump into a lot of the demos to, to reinforce uh, the, the material that we'll be coming, reviewing here. Uh, and then we'll just wrap up with kind of where things are today and kind of what we'll be doing moving forward. So uh, again, this is who we are. Uh, Paul Cleary, um, Senior Principal and Software Engineer at Comcast, author of Vinyl DNS, and Joe, um, I don't know if you have a few words that you want to say about yourself? Nope, um, Vicky introduced us pretty well. Yep, I think she did a good job, thank you, Vicky. So what is Vinyl DNS? It's, it's, it's a platform for DNS governance. Um, and so it is vendor agnostic in that we talk to any DNS backend. Uh, bet by nine, not DNS, power DNS, uh, including public cloud now with Route 53. And it's a uniform interface for managing your DNS records across all of those uh, systems. And as part of that, you can imagine if you uh, manage your records through a uniform interface, then you have a single view of the data, the operations, who changed what, um, and uh, you know what are your most active zones, and where does your data live, and things like that. And I like to say that um, Vinyl DNS is self-service DNS with guard, guard, guardrails uh, and with gobs of access controls. Uh, kind of a, a nutshell, 50,000 foot view of what Vinyl DNS is. So when we look at the background on, on how things started at Comcast, in, in the aughts and early teens, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of engineers at Comcast. There's a lot of systems that were being built. Uh, in the aughts, you know, was the rise of the Agile movement, and, and after that, the rise of the DevOps movement, and certainly Comcast runs a lot of hardware, um, and we also, you know, at the same time period, we run a lot of uh, private clouds as well, and, and so these DevOps practices uh, started to push the envelope with respect to doing infrastructure automation. Uh, some best practices like immutable infrastructure, uh, immutable builds and deployments, um, where you're constantly setting up, uh, setting up and tearing down infrastructure to run any com number of applications that, that are running inside of Comcast at any one time. And part of that is, you know, DNS changes needs to be made constantly in order to direct that traffic as part of, part of those, uh, you know, DevOps, you know, practices. Um, and there's a bunch of things that came out of that infrastructure as code uh, being one of them. Uh, a lot of people here may be familiar with things like Chef and Puppet and Salt Stack and Ansible and things like that. These are all automation tools that that kind of enable uh, these these uh, dev, DevOps practices and, and deployment practices. So on the one hand, we had agility, uh, and and that, that that's on one side of this uh, this screen. And the other side, had governance. The, the the fact of the matter is is that DNS records are some of the most important assets that we have in any company. Um, you know, so you need the level of, of governance and who's changing what, uh, where. Um, you can imagine intervert and DNS changes can cause outages and you, you never want to have any malicious DNS changes happen. Um, and so this is kind of like the, the state of the world uh, as we started off in, in the aughts and early teens. Um, and then Joe will talk a little bit about some of the challenges that we were facing uh, leading up to vinyl DNS. Thanks, Paul. So, um, as Paul mentioned, you know, we did have some challenges before we had vinyl DNS and some of them, you know, was around automation. There was the, the previous tool that we had was a pretty manual process. Our, our operations team did have ways to automate some of that 
that that workflow but there were you know there were some issues that that you know some of that workflow and that and that code could have inadvertently did something because it was not doing the best dns practices of putting a record in or doing validations to make sure that um, certain records should belong where they are and, and certain records shouldn't go where they go um, you know there were there were times that you know it just to take time to review the changes um, some of those changes would get rejected and you know the the end user that's trying to make those dns changes um, wouldn't understand and wouldn't know what's going on in, in, until it was you know mission critical for them to be like oh well this really needs to be done and done now so um, we, we tried to correct a lot of those things. Um, <clears throat> we had an SLA of 24 hours uh, with the old process. Sometimes that would turn into two or three days, depending on you know how many changes got put in that day and, and, and how many engineers were, you know, operations engineers were able to get to them that day while they were doing their other duties. Um, you know, it, 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 the automation, it's just, you know, we really wanted to get into the DevOps mind of, being able to automate, you know, from, from beginning to end on everything that you wanted to do for the end users and not let DNS be your stopper, not let the, the records that you need to be put in to be the stopper. Um, we also needed something that, that was, you know, would scale out. You know, we have over millions, hundreds of millions of DNS records, uh, you know, millions of zones and, and thousands of, of, of changes a day. And you know that can that can really add up if you're not on top of it. Um, we also wanted to make sure that, like I said earlier, best practices were taken care. You know, were were, were taken in. You know, is is a C name being trying to be put in an apex? Is you know our dotted hosts being put in where we want? Um, you know, those types of things. Uh, you know, is a delegation going to break that dotted host? That you know, there's 15 dotted hosts underneath that that zone. Um, is that going to break production? Uh, we we really needed those guard where, guardrails. Um, we also wanted to be make to make sure that the security and, and the people that are doing these changes are the people that we expect to do those changes. Are they approved to do that? Are they allowed to to make a change to this zone? Are they allowed to make a change to this record in that zone? So we wanted to be able to pinpoint. Joe over here made a change to www.comcast.com at, at 2 p.m. on Friday, and why? It, 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 something broke because of that, you know, why was that change put in? So we wanted these guardrails there, and that's what Vine DNS uh, came out of. Um, it, it, you know, initially came from something that we wanted to replace, uh, another tool we wanted to replace, and it became an internal tool that uh, is used company-wide every day, uh, <laughs> all the time. Thanks, so. You can go to the next um, slide. So, so yeah, the um, so those were some of the challenges that that Joe had covered um, that led to the rise of Vinyl DNS. Um, and it really just was that tension between automation and governance and and security, right? We have to have both of those hats on when we're managing our DNS infrastructure. So we built Vinyl DNS initially as an API gateway to enable safe DNS record management for internal engineering teams. You know, we imagine, um, you know, the people that were on the, the edge of the DevOps movement wasn't all of Comcast at that time. Um, it was, it was uh, you know, uh, some of them, some portion of that. And so uh, it was a much smaller footprint, a more technical audience that we kind of, um, that we targeted with the initial, uh, the initial release. Uh, and the, the, the first uh, governance model that we created was a model called private zones. Um, private zones, have the power user in mind. Uh, it is an experience similar to Route 53, and we'll, we'll show that in a demo. Um, and the idea with uh, private zones is that uh, you connect to a zone in Vile DNS, and that you're able to uh, assign ownership to some group, you know, some, some group of people. It can be one person or it can be 10 people, doesn't matter. Um, and then it's up to those people. Those people have full access to uh, manage the records in those zones, but they also have the ability to manage access to records in that zone. So for example, they can delegate access or provide access to a different team to manage a certain subset of records. They can manage them based off of, um, you know, record name matching, record type matching. Um, for reverse zones, they can, they can uh, uh, provide access based off of contiguous IP space, CIDR rules, so to speak. So that was kind of what we had in mind when, when we first built this out. 
the other thing that we had was uh, a, a pretty straightforward REST API. Uh, we do uh, sign requests. So we have, uh, we do uh, request signing in order to cut down or eliminate the uh, man in the middle attacks for, for uh, manipulating data in transit. And so uh, we, we built out, started building out uh, client integrations with this automation. One of our earliest co uh, client integration was, was uh, a developer, uh, Mike Ball, um, who's a member of Comcast had actually uh, built a Terraform provider uh, that did integration with uh, the Vinyl DNS REST API and then tied it into their infrastructure automation pipelines. So it was very easy to grow out a whole ecosystem of people who needed automation um, and they kind of built their own uh, tooling around Vinyl DNS. So with that, uh, we'll, we'll kind of cut out now into our first demo portion, where we'll kind of we'll go through private zones and what they what what they look like, and and a lot of the portal, and you get to see uh, a lot of things here for the first time. The uh, the the LDAP server that comes with the quick start, uh, the demo that we're running here is Futurama based. Um, so they're all of your Futurama characters are in there as as users of the LDAP uh, LDAP users. So we have a couple of people we'll be talking about here. Um, Bender is a bot and he is a, the bot's own bots.planetexpress.com. Hermes, uh, he's an accountant and he's a member, a member of the accountants group. And he is a, a zone owner for uh, finance.planetexpress.com. And Leela, of course, Leela is the captain. Uh, she is uh, a vinyl DNS, what we refer to as a sysadmin. It's gone through different names, super user, support user as well. And so she's basically the one that's going to be doing a lot of, uh, of touching during this demo as well. So here's our login. I have this running locally uh, in Docker. Um, you know, the only requirements you need really are the uh, API and portal and as well as a MySQL database. Uh, we do have a, uh, in this demo, a BIN9 server. That's the, the, the authoritative DNS system for this demo. So I'm gonna log in first as Leela. And we can see here that this is the login for Vinyl DNS. Um, and before I kind of talk about a lot of things here, because there's going to be a lot of things to see here, uh, the first thing it's fundamental to understand is groups. Groups are how all the permissioning, access controls, uh, all the governance happens effectively at the group level. Um, it's important to note that group, uh, groups are a Vinyl DNS construct. Uh, this does not today. Um, it are not uh, groups in your OpenID system or your LDAP system. These are groups that are managed fully within Vinyl DNS. It's a self-service model. Uh, it's not saying that we couldn't do the other things. It's just the way that it, the system has evolved right now. So groups are just arbitrary members, uh, people that uh, are in Vinyl DNS or in your uh, LDAP backend. And so we see here we have uh, several groups, accountants with Hermes, admins with Leela, bots with Bender. And a group is nothing more than, you know, any name that you want to give it, you know, for example. Uh, and an email address is always important for a group because sometimes you want to reach out to folks in a group. Um, so a distribution email list is something that we'll use or an individual email sometimes as well. Um, and then adding people to a group is as simple as, you know, as, as long as they're in the LDAP system, we can add them. So we can add Fry, we can add the professor. Uh, who are all in the, the LDAP database. And they come in as, as Vinyl DNS users. And the only other concept here that's important is this idea of a group manager. And a group manager is anybody who can add and remove members of a group. Okay. So this is the group screen. Um, I don't think that there's a whole lot there um, around groups other than being people that, that are in the same bucket, but it's extremely important to understand their significance and how uh, you govern um, the rest of Vinyl DNS. So the next thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna show uh, zones. So this zones are, uh, you have two tabs in here. One is my zones and my zones are uh, any uh, zone that you specifically own, you're a zone admin for, um, or zones that you've been granted access to. Um, so right here, I'm Leela, so I can see everything. She's a sysadmin. So you can see the zones that have already been set up within this, uh, within Vinyl DNS. And now the first, what I'm first gonna do is gonna go ahead and connect to a zone. It's important to note that we do not create zones yet in Vinyl DNS. We connect to existing zones. 
Um, so if there is a new subdomain that needs to be created, typically within Comcast, we'll, um, you know, we'll have somebody request that uh, zone be set up if they don't, it's not already set up and, and uh, the DNS engineering team will go ahead and do that. So in the connecting to a zone, you specify the zone name and we're gonna say planetexpress.com. And a distribution email, which is not the same thing on the SOA record. It's just an arbitrary uh, record right now. And then you assign an admin group. Um, and this will be like, for example, I'm gonna say this is admins because planetexpress.com is the umbrella uh, domain for all the, the Futurama uh, subdomains. And then when you connect to it, um, this, is, this is where um, you have to specify what backend it lives on, what DNS backend. So you might have uh, a specific authoritative uh, DNS system in the backend that might be by nine, it might be a Route 53 account that, uh, or an AWS account running Route 53. Uh, you'll be able to choose these backends. These backends are defined in configuration files. Um, information on there is in our, uh, in the, operator's guide for how you set up and configure backends. So if the, you can choose the backend that's been pre-configured or you can override at the zone level your own TSIG key uh, secret um, and server and port that you want to connect to as well. I would say that, and, and besides the things that you see here, there is a global default and it's also a configuration item. It's basically the, the backend that has the default backend ID is the, uh, the global default. So we're just gonna go ahead, it's gonna accept the defaults here. And you can see I have this, this new zone that's been connected to within Vinyl DNS. And when you click on it, you, as a zone owner, I have all of these, these things that we see in here. Um, at the top of this screen, I have the most recent record changes. Uh, when we connect to a zone, the very first thing we do is we issue a zone sync that loads all of the record sets. It's a zone transfer in DNS. It, it's a different API call if it's a different backend to load all of the existing records in that zone into vinyl DNS. At this bottom here, you'll see here's a list of records. Now there's three. <laughs> there's not a lot of interesting here, but some of the zones at Comcast, we have uh, 50,000, 100,000 records in it. Um, so having some kind of capable search uh, facility here is, is pretty important. And it also gives you the ability to, um, you know, besides syncing a zone, you can create a record set here if you wanted to. Um, I'll create a record set called demo. Um, and it'll add it. It usually is implemented right away. Sometimes you have to refresh and you'll see that it's getting, gets added to the um, our records that in that zone. The managed zone is kind of is only a, for zone admins or uh, sysadmins, and so they allow you to toggle the connectivity information for this, um, the backend that it lives on, or the key information. You know, you can update the TCP if you have a rotation or something along those lines. Uh, the other thing that you can do is specify the the admin group, the the people that own this zone, um, as well as the access modifier, and we'll touch on that in a later demo. But the important thing in this screen um, is the access rules that we want to show. And, and we talk about uh, if I own this zone, but I want to allow somebody else to manage records in it. So what I can do is create an access rule. Uh, it defines, uh, you can define at a user level or a group level. It's most of the time it's going to be group level. Uh, you can choose a, a group that we want to have access. In this case, I'm going to allow accountants to have access to the zone. The access level itself, um, you know, read, you know, we're, we're toying with the idea of making vinyl DNS read only, so that would kind of go away, but write is the ability to create an update and delete is the ability to create update and delete records within the zone. And so um, typically it's gonna be delete, which is full access to the zone. For the records, you can choose one record type, you can choose a number of record types uh, that you wanna grant access to. For example, I can say, I wanna allow, um, a, only A records as part of this ACL rule. And then finally you can choose for forward zones, uh, a mask. So um, we, let's, it's a record mask is a regular expression. So I can say, for example, fin.star. So I'll allow the accountant team to create any record that start with fin. And that's all you have to do in order to grant access to, um, to this zone, okay? 
And I think that's, so I've created this zone now. I've granted access to the accountants group and I'm gonna log out real quick. I'm gonna log in as Hermes. Hermes is our accountant. And you'll see in his list of zones, he does now see planetexpress.com because he has access to it. Um, and so if he goes into planetexpress.com and he says, I wanna go and create a record, and I'm going to create a record called um, bad. You'll see that he's forbidden access from doing that because it doesn't match against the, uh, the regular expression that we had set up for him. Instead, what we'll do is we'll create a record uh, called uh, thin01. And you'll see that it goes ahead and creates the record for him. And then, so he has access and you'll on the screen, he has action buttons that allow him to update or delete just the records he has access to. Okay. And I think that's, that's the, that's the, this demo that I want to go through, just covering on, on groups and zones. Um, you do also have the ability, um, to uh, submit DNS requests against zones that you're an admin of or you have access to, and we'll, we'll see that in a second. Okay. Now, going back to our, our slide deck. So scale for the enterprise. Uh, back in the 2016 timeframe, 2017, there was discussions with uh, internal organizations at Comcast, especially uh, the DNS team and Joe, Joe Crow to kind of scale this out. Um, before we were targeting the power user interface, these are DevOps people that tend to be more technical. Um, and as we started to talk about scaling out, it became evident that there was a whole different persona that needed to be supported in the system and that was casual users. Um, these might be level one, level two analysts or uh, support uh, personnel, this might be managers uh, frontline managers, <laughs> um, it could be field personnel. So a whole different <laughs> look and feel that needed to be added to the system and a whole different set of features that needed to be added to support them. So a lot of the feature set that we did, we did a gap analysis between where we wanted to be and where we were. And we came out with a, a, a bunch of features that are mentioned in the case study here. Um, the first one's high value domains. You can imagine that there are, are uh, DNS records that you do not want anybody modifying unless they have super, super privileges. Um, and the, the idea of having a system like Final DNS, having the ability to modify those, even if accidentally, is very scary. Um, you know, those could be any of like your www domains, like www.apple.com, for example. You know, you don't want Vinyl DNS ever touching that system. Uh, so we have this concept of high value domains and those are properties that you just can't touch. The second point here is that the ACL rule model did not scale to millions of users and like say five, 6,000 users, um, especially these casual users. Uh, so you can imagine if people were trying to set up access to these zones <coughs> across organizations and keeping up with it as, as personnel change and things like that, excuse me, it would be just a, a maintenance nightmare for, for these people who are mostly casual users to being setting up and managing these ACL rules. So we need a different, more permissive, but slightly different uh, uh, governance model. And that was really around shared zones. And so shared zones uh, effectively are the idea that you can open up uh, forward space or reverse space so that anybody could work in it. Uh, however, you have the ability to uh, um, claim a record um, or a record set it's at the record set level by saying the person who creates this record set is the person who owns it for the lifetime of that record set until it's deleted. So it's, it's basically extending the ownership model down almost to the record set level in, a, in this kind of shared uh, uh, model. And, and to touch on that real quick, Paul, it's, mm -hmm. that also gives accountability to, to you know, as as organizations grow and, and 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 you know people have left the team or you know have moved on usually you know paul touched on this earlier we want to make sure that record ownership is tied to a distro more so than a person but the person in that distro would be the per that show that did the change but at least we can say hey yeah we have this record that's been sitting here and it's stale now and we want to make sure it's gone we were, we were able to reach out to that team and say, hey, that's, you know, 
we want to make sure that we can remove this without causing any issues for you, even though we know it's stale. They might have like lost uh, track to it as well. So that you know, that was one of our bigger bigger things that we wanted to do to replace uh, on the enterprise level um, from our older uh, infrastructure. Yeah, and it, and it definitely and I point out here too is that we you know IP4 space is shared by almost like by default because it's so limited. Uh, so a lot of times our reverse zones within Comcast tend to be shared. Um, you know, we definitely have infrastructure that is 100% the IP space is dedicated to them, but there's also, uh, when you start talking about some more of these generic applications and private clouds and things like that, that tend to be just buckets of IP space that are, are anybody can come in, claim, and then decommission. So reverse space lends itself to, um, to the shared model pretty well. The, the next bullet point is that some things require manual review. Uh, there are uh, certain cases, I mean, uh, I think uh, Joe might be able to, to talk a little bit about some of them, but, you know, sometimes it's like, you know, it's not a high value domain, but we want to make sure you really know what you're doing. And so we implemented this manual review workflow um, so that somebody can actually approve or reject changes. Now, this is not a state machine. On that, it's not. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, on that, it's, sorry, I've been, I was cutting out a little bit there. Um, I think he's still cutting out. Okay, we'll see if Joe comes back in. Um, but the uh, the manual review is not a state machine. It's it is a very simple workflow that's just approve or reject an entire batch of changes. Sorry about that. I dropped. <laughs> I think I can there? hear you now. I can hear you now. Okay. Awesome. Uh, uh, so yeah, on, on the schedule changes part of it, it's it's more of making sure that production changes uh, happen. I think we lost you again, Joe. Okay, let's 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 move on, Joe. We're gonna we're gonna try and move on. And uh, apologies for. Uh, that, uh, um, and it was something that you know. We kind of had in the old system, but uh, it, it it really got refined with final DNS. Okay. Yeah, we we lost you a little bit there, Joe, but we'll, we can circle back to that. Um, so the 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 fourth item there was ownership of records, and we won't cut, touch it touch into this. We're not going to show this too much, but there were these really weird edge cases. But you can imagine with Comcast that we have an organization on one side of the globe, literally that provision DNS records and a whole separate organization on the other side of the globe that decommissions those. And there's very little kind of cross chatter between them. And so we needed a way to enable uh, this ability, we call them global ACLs, to allow uh, a certain level override the very edge casey. Uh, but we did have that at, at the, the scale of Comcast, we did have that, that kind of uh, situation come up. And then the last thing is scheduled changes. Um, Schedule changes uh, are, you can imagine that there's a maintenance personnel or somebody in the field personnel and they need to do something. And sometimes you need to make, say, hey, I need this DNS record changed at 10 o'clock on a Saturday. Uh, right now it is, it's, it's a manual process right now, um, but it, it isn't too far of a stretch to make sure that uh, changes are automatically applied at a certain time as well. We just didn't implement that yet. Um, so I'll just jump into demo scaling features. Vicki, uh, am I still with everybody or have I been talking for the last 15 minutes without anybody no, hearing me? No, no uh, we're all uh, following along uh, and you're getting a nice queue of questions. Um, Great. Uh, so uh, carry on. Great, yeah, I think that we only have about 10 minutes or so left, so we'll have plenty of time for Q&A at the end. So this is uh, scaling, we'll we're gonna demo those features that we just reviewed uh, and scaling this out. Um, so I'm gonna log back in to as Leela. And uh, she's gonna go ahead and uh, create a shared zone. Um, and I'll show you how that's done. It, the same thing applies, it's the normal process. Uh, there's a zone called common, uh, that planet express.com. Uh, and I'll own by the vinyl by the vinyl admin group. And the way that you make a zone shared is that you go into the zone and you go into this manage zone tab 
and you change this access modifier. So not a whole lot, it's, it's very easy to do this. Uh, <laughs> so you can make it shared um, and then you have to uh, update the zone. And so if I go back to my zones list, you can see now I have comma.planetexpress.com, but the access is shared. And effectively that means that uh, anybody can go and uh, create a uh, change against this zone. So I'm gonna log back out and I'll show how you would go about doing that. So I'm gonna log back in this time as Bender. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna go to this DNS changes uh, tab uh, and a DNS, this is where you submit your DNS requests. Um, again, this is what we call the casual user experience. Um, you know, the one thing that's important to note is that to work with shared zones, you have to go through the casual user experience. Um, but I'm sure that most casual users are happy to go through the screen because it's a, it's, it's simplified version of what you can see from the power user experience. And so I'll create a, a DNS change here. Um, and you can put in a description. This is for your own uh, archive, archival reasons why you made this change. And I made this change to the shared zone demo. And here is where you do the group ownership. Okay. Um, again, whatever you choose here, if you create a record within a shared DNS zone, whatever group that you choose here is going to be the record owner for that. Um, I would say that at Comcast, 99.9% .9 of users are in one group. So this isn't an issue and it'll be the default. Um, it only gets a little bit sticky if a user happens to be in multiple groups and sometimes they question about which one they should choose or not. Um, but this is also one of those situations where while it is admittedly like one of the things we get um, some support user questions on, um, it is, uh, you know, when in this battle between uh, security um, and uh, convenience security wins out every time as well as far as when we're discussing features with vinyl DNS. So I'm going to go ahead and make bots the user here. Uh, you can schedule a date time. Um, I'm not going to go into that as part of this demo, um, but you can imagine you just choose a date and time when you want that to be scheduled for. And then here we have a list of changes. Uh, you can create up to um, a thousand DNS changes, but it's a configuration item. Uh, the more changes you have to do, the more stress it puts on the system at one time. Um, so really it's just kind of, it's arbitrary number based off of how things perform really. Uh, we choose a thousand because that's a pretty safe number to be in. It could be higher or lower. Um, and so I'm gonna add a, a few changes here. I'm gonna add a text record and I'm gonna add uh, one called uh, bots. Uh, actually, I'm gonna call it uh, www.01 dot bots dot planet express dot com one dot one dot one dot one I'm gonna have uh add another change actually you know what make this an A record add another A record www.bots.planetexpress.com dot dot com two dot two dot two dot two uh, and then I'm also going to add a text record in the shared zone. I'm going to call it bots rule dot uh, common dot planet express dot com. And I'm going to say here. And then finally, I'm going to add a change of a text record called bots rule dot finance dot planet express dot com. And you can imagine that, uh, you know, Bender as being a bot does not have access to finance, uh, the finance zone. So this last entry here should be stopped, um, but we should be able to proceed with the other one. So I'm gonna go ahead and submit this. And you see, we get an immediate error. Now it's important to note that at a DNS, when you create a DNS request with a set of changes, we do our best um, to make it all or nothing. Like all the changes will go in or none of the changes go in. So it's kind of like a, a single transaction with all these DNS records happening across all of the zones that you might have access to. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and delete this because uh, uh, for, for this demo, and I'm just gonna go ahead and, and continue with this. And you'll see that all of these records are now applied. I've created records in uh, bots that I own. So I've created these two records here. And I've also created a, a record named bots rule in common uh, .planetexpress .com. 
And if I were to go through a record search and look for bots rule, I'll be able to see that I do have um, uh, a couple of uh, records that are that live in here. Okay. Um, okay. Um, that's the um, that's the, uh, the 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 bulk request shared zone model, and I would say that this this uh, interface here is um, is used by the majority of our users, um, as well as that it's used by the majority of our, our automation as well. So the next thing now I'm going to just show real quick in the same one is manual review. So if I were to create um, a new um, record, I'm going to call it manual review. Again, bots will be the owner of this. And I'm going to add uh, a record um, in, um, I'm going to say, bots.secret.planetexpress.com. Now, this secret.planetexpress.com is a zone that I have specifically configured to be uh, anything that goes in there is for manual review. So I'm going to add a record, an A record in there. I'll add another change for an A record, and let's just say uh, bots two dot bots dot or better than that dev one dot bots dot planet express dot com. And I'm going to go ahead and submit that. Now remember, I don't have access to secret, or I do have access, but it's a manual review. And you'll see that the change goes into this pending review state. And it's up to somebody, anybody, to go ahead and approve or reject um, this request when it comes in. And so um, you can see it says this needs to be done. And you'll note that the one that I do have access to, the change I, I should be able to apply, is stuck in a pending state until the entire request is approved or rejected. Okay. So let me log out and I'll log back in as Leela. And then Lena, Leela can see now in her uh, request lists, she can say, oh, I have one up for manual review. And she has the ability to uh, approve or reject it as a whole, or she can reject it or deny it, OK? Um, you can't reject individual line items. You do have to reject as a whole. And the reason that we do that is because you can imagine if somebody created a bunch of A records, but then created a C name for them as well, you know, if you, you know, can you reject a C name and have everything else go forward, you're going to have an incomplete request and it's going to be hard to parse that out. So we do reject as a whole and tell the user, hey, you know, the C name is invalid. You're going to need to do X, B, A, B, and C. You know, you, you know, you can't have a C name at the, uh, at the, at origin or whatever happens to be the case. But we're going to go ahead and confirm approval. Um, and then you'll note that it does happen pretty quickly. Uh, so here we go. We have this own uh, this this change has been applied uh, for bots.secret um, and dev1. And if I search for them, dev1 star, you can see that I have indeed created that record. All right, that's that review manual review. The very last one is a very fast one, even faster. Um, I'm going to go and try as Leela. Remember, Leela's a sysadmin. So she has full rights to do everything. She's going to go ahead and try and delete dub dub dub, which is a high value domain. Um, so if she goes ahead and deletes it, she's going to see an error pop up on the screen that says it's a high value domain and cannot be modified. Okay. And that ends our tour. Uh, one other thing to point uh, that you don't see here is that this left nav bar is somewhat configurable. You can add items here. And it's one of the features uh, that we added recently. So we do have like internal documentation that you can link out to and stuff like that uh, beyond what comes up here in these can set of, of documentation out of the box. You can customize these docs links. Okay. And that is the end of the demo. So I'll turn this over to Joe. If Joe, if we can hear you to talk through the <laughs> final DNS results. Yeah, good old internet. I wish I knew somebody at Comcast. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, um, thanks for the demos, uh, Paul. Uh,
very useful and uh, the kids who use this uh, product. Um, I don't know if you can hear me. We, we kind of lost you. Yeah, we keep losing you. Can you hear me now? If the meeting is going to be here, other one. Yep. All right, that should be better. Still, still an echo on your line. Yeah, the phone's dying now. I think it's better. I think it's okay. So yeah, as um, thanks for for sharing the demos because that's kind of what the casual user is going to see. Um, there are some power users that use vinyl DNS with the API. Um, and that's, you know, that's going to be the bulk, at least for us, that's, that's the bulk of the DevOps users. And that was our main focus, you know, making sure everybody um, is able to, to use this uh, and, and get their products out and, and their projects out uh, in a timely manner. Um, currently, um, Vinyl DNS is used for all of our internal zones. We're not doing it for customer space just yet. Um, it is something that has been discussed on, on seeing how we can utilize Vinyl DNS um, for our customers' DNS. Um, you know, as mentioned before, we have millions of DNS records. Um, there, the, the changes, there's thousands of changes that happen a day. Um, and, you know, we, we really just, you know, this has became a mission critical kind of product for Comcast. It's been something that we need to be able to uh, keep maintained and, and, and keep running and make sure that, you know, um, that the teams that are using it uh, have the support that they need, um, not only from just the vinyl DNS team, but even from the DNS uh, engineering team. Um, we'd like to provide some of the best practices for how things are done. Um, we, you know, the, we have an operations team that kind of goes over the, the, the manual review, and then you have our DNS engineering team, which we, uh, we pretty much will make sure that if you have those difficult questions of why you can't have a C name at an apex, or why can't you have these dotted hosts, or why can't I, this delegation be here, we kind of try to help shape why. Um, you know, there, there are some, some things that, you know, we're, we're looking to do in the future, um, I think we'll touch that base on that um, shortly, but um, you know, as I mentioned, this is something that for us, this tool has has saved um, saved a lot of time and 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 resources to to uh, to be implemented correctly and to be able to push forward. Um, Paul Cleary and, and his team, uh, when when they developed this, um, asked all the right questions, and and we we were able to lay out something that. Uh, Lay out like our needs, uh, and and they've been fulfilled pretty, uh, pretty much, pretty well. And um, you know, there there's uh, there's some progress to be made, and some some. Darn it, we heard you, but now you cut out. Well, it's good news for you, uh, Paul, because it sounds like there's not as much progress to be made as uh, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. He said, he just dropped the mic. Go ahead, Joe. You had to finish. Uh, no, that was it. <laughs> okay, that was good. Yeah, you said there's some progress to be made, and then that was all we heard. <laughs> uh, there, yeah, there, there. Sorry, there is still some progress to be made um, on on some of the on on some of the things that we we would like to see on our roadmap finished. But um, for the initial rollout and or for for where it is now, it is you know it, it's at a point we can kind of. Um, take some of the bigger things that we would really like to do and, and focus on them because we have a great framework um, and, and foundation currently um, with the DNS governance or it, for the governance that we needed around this type of tooling. Cool. Um, so in the futures kind of wrap up slide, uh, you know, the one thing that's been pushed off now for a little bit is the, the zone management. Um, this is actually having the ability to create and delete zones, move zones around and things like that. On the DNS servers themselves, um, you know, it was the, 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 the scaling out features just took priority from our standpoint. Uh, but this is something that we're back into working on now. 
Um, and it ties into the next piece, which is the vinyl DNS admin experience. You can imagine now if you have the sing a single system that has visibility into everything DNS uh, at your company, you know, what are some of the other things that you could do with that data, you know, you know statistics and metrics and monitoring, as well as um, on the vinyl DNS admin side, we do, we do push things, a lot of things to config. Um, and we do that purposely because you really have to know what you're doing to change the configuration files as opposed to like accidentally, you know, you know, clicking a button that you didn't mean to in the UI. Um, but we do think that there's a, there's opportunity for a number of those configuration items like uh, backends, for example, to be pulled into, to an admin experience within uh, vinyl DNS itself. Yeah. And I'd like to touch on that one real quick because, you know, as, as we tout vinyl DNS as being an agnostic front end for, you know, all DNS providers, we really, you know, one of, one of my goals, at least from, you know, an, an engineering and DNS mind is I'd like to be able to take this backend database that we have all of our records and build any type of config for any type of DNS service that's out there, DNS vendor that's out there. So that way, you know, if, you know, if you want to test, um, you, you want to test the authoritative DNS servers of, of not or bind or, or unbound, you can kind of say, hey, I can build that zone data right from here. And, you know, that's kind of another source of truth, a source of truth aside from your, your hidden authoritatives currently. Yeah, and I think that's it. Uh, that's where we wind up. Um, that I put a link for chat if you want to hop in and talk final DNS uh, with the folks on here. Um, issues, if you have issues that you find that you want to submit. Um, and, and here's our doc site, our main doc site is uh, finaldns.io. That's all I have. Okay, great. I'm just going to launch the poll. Um, so as you feel like it, uh, go ahead and answer the questions in the poll and then um, we'll share them at the very end. Um, uh, we have quite a few questions in the Q&A. Uh, I'll be happy to read them. Uh, you also can see them yourself. Uh, there's one question that Joe already answered from Peter. Um, are there any plans for DNSSEC integration to handle key information or to provide DNS key uh, or DS uh, information to users? And so yeah, uh, there there is you know with some current things that we've been looking at, where you know that is uh, kind of come up front for us. So I um I, I I've had high level conversations about this in the past, and I think we're in a we're in a place that we can start looking at how we can utilize the DNSSEC data and uh, utilize vinyl to give reports or, or give us some information. Um, you know, I, I've, I've toyed with the idea of seeing how we can utilize DNS viz at the same time. <laughs> yeah, and we, do, and we do also have teams that are, are looking at or at already have uh, using vinyl DNS for things for like Let's Encrypt and, and DNS challenges as well. Uh, just nothing that's out there in, in the open. Yeah, and you're currently like at delegations. You're allowed. You're you're able to put um, DS records. So we have some teams that sign their own zones, and they will, you know, we they put in their own DS records, and and they sign from from their zone down. So we we you know we encourage that. We really do. Um, so it's it's something that uh, we'd like to have adopted a little bit more across the board. So yeah, um, yeah, we we're definitely looking forward to um, getting some more DNSSEC options available. Okay, um, uh, we have a question from Andreas. Can the groups be nested? Currently now, there is no hierarchy. It's a very flat hierarchy. I mean, it's a very flat structure um, in vinyl DNS. Okay. But that's, where, that's where the ACLs come in kind of for a zone. So you can, you can have the main, use the group, and then you can have in that, in that zone, you can add, you know, as, as uh, Paul pointed out and showed earlier, you can add different groups to do just specific things within that zone. So there was a, a question from Richard, uh, is there any limit on the number of groups? And Paul's already answered uh, that we have over a thousand and growing. Uh, honestly, the scale of this deployment is, uh, is impressive. <laughs> um, there's a question from Scott. Do you intend to make zone ads or subdomain ads for a user that already owns a zone uh, part of vinyl DNS? So the zone ads part of it, um, creating zones is something that we do not, are uh, unable to do 
currently, but you can add subdomains in a zone that's currently connected. Um, and then you can connect that zone, that new zone after it's delegated and, and do everything from there. Um, but as soon as, uh, it, when it comes to creating a brand new zone that does not exist, uh, that's currently not available, but that is something that we are working towards. Yeah, it's a good question on that one. Zone, zone admins, uh, uh, zone ads is part of this umbrella of zone management. And we do, we do enable this feature where somebody says, I want to add, uh, it, you know, we can automatically add a zone that doesn't exist when somebody specifies a subdomain, um, or they can just do a zone ad there and then automatically inherit all the permissions from uh, the zone, uh, you know, the parent zone, the direct parent zone that, that they already own. Um, again, it's a good question. It's part of that discussion around what zone management means. Uh, here's a question uh, from Stefan. Is it possible to add LDAP groups to the vinyl DNS group? Yeah, we had, we, this is a good question. We, you know, uh, we, we're so big at, at Comcast. <laughs> so, uh, so our LDAP installation you can manage is pre pretty massive as well. Um, we, it is possible from a feature perspective and, and probably low hanging fruit to, um, to, to sync up LDAP groups with vinyl DNS groups. We just, we just haven't done it because our LDAP installation is just not amenable to it um, is, is the best answer. So for like me to actually test that out, um, that capability out would be rather difficult um, other than you know, doing some advanced configuration on our, our test LDAP installation or setup. Hopefully that answers your question. Okay, here's a question from Andreas. Uh, are dependencies of the records taken into account? I think you actually, after he asked this, I think you showed this, but for example, uh, the A record of a C name. Yeah, I think that I need a little bit more like dependencies of a record taken into account. Like if you delete a C name, do you automatically delete the A record and things like that? Um, is how I'm reading it. Um, my, my answer would be no, like we, we don't automatically clean up a records from C names. Uh, but one of the things that, you know, I know that Joe and I have had, had some discussion about is like, you know, what does it mean for, you know, these dependent records? Um, and what should we do from a user experience standpoint? We're, we're open to, to conversations on those, but right now you kind of manage those separately. No, one thing you did demo was, um, though, uh, evaluating a set of changes together. Um, in fact, you were specifically, when you were demoing it, you were saying, well, the reason we can't, um, uh, so Andreas has updated his question. He says the other way around, uh, do you delete the C name if the A, 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 A record is gone? Yeah, and uh, we don't do that right now. We don't do the tracking there, but you'll see it. And we didn't, I didn't jump into it too deep. Um, we have A plus PTR is like one of the change types that you can make so that we create the forward and reverse record at the same time. Um, we, we, you can add other change types. We have not done that yet for uh, C name in a records right now. And there's currently a GitHub, um, uh, issue open or feature request open around something similar that where, um, it kind of checks for stale, uh, C names. It kind of came from, uh, some of the AW, like AWS endpoints being stale and being able to identify that and, and, and report on that. Um, but I think, you know, I, I, I like that, that idea, Andreas, is trying to, um, to, to delete the C name if it's, you know, if you're off for it and, and able to do that, kind of go down that chain. Yeah, and it was also, there's some complexities into a chain, right? Like, what if it, if you, you know, it's not just one C name, if you have a chain of C names, you know, and, and, and managing that, those dependencies, you can get uh, a little bit hairy, I'm sure. Yeah, there's a, a follow on comment or question from Richard. Uh, does it check that the target name resolves before implementing the C name, uh, which is another another good check. Yeah, I think we have checks going in for for um, C names, especially. Um, we also check to make sure that there's no other record available or uh, uh, there and, and that C names the only thing there. Yeah, I'll have to double check that one for you, Richard, um, as a takeaway. That's something that we do have a pretty robust validation framework. So some of these, I don't know off the top of my head, uh, but it's easy enough to add them if we are missing anything. Um, okay, uh, so uh, Siobhan is asking, how modular are the various components of Vinyl DNS? For example, the access control, the groups, the authorization, the UI, 
Um, so for instance, if, a, if an organization wanted to use only one component of vinyl DNS, is that possible? Yeah, and I'm curious about what one component would be. Um, you know, we, we, you certainly can do everything all shared. You can certainly do only private zones. You can configure, there's a lot of feature flags around turning off manual review, turning off schedule changes and things like that. Uh, so there is a lot of things that you can do um, uh, on there, but I'm not, I'm not sure what they mean by just one component. Yeah, I can see since a big part of your uh, use case was to ensure uh, security, um, that's something you could uh, certainly compromise if you pick and choose modules. Uh, so Scott is asking, are there checks if a record already exists? Um, maybe they did not, the user did not intend to make a round robin entry, but is adding a second record when it's not needed. Yeah, this is, this is kind of a, an interesting, yes, there are checks uh, to make sure a record already exists. We, we have actually a config flag uh, because there's different per perspectives on round robin records. And so the initial implementation was actually that we did not support round robin DNS uh, records, um, but then we added support. Um, and we added a, a configuration flag to turn that on or off. Um, and so by default, I think it's off. And then you actually have to turn it on. So if you want to allow users to create multiple A records uh, with the same record name. OK, um, Andres is asking if uh, you can customize the, the drop down menu of record types to add more other different record types. So the the, number, the record types that we have we support are in there. We can add additional record types if needed. There's a, a well known, a well established pattern for doing that, and there definitely are. Um, there are. I know on the shared zone, which is the common user experience or the casual user experience, we do have the ability to say which ones are allowable to be, at, you know, to go through that uh, that DNS change screen, that casual user experience, because. Not everybody knows how to, for example, create an NS record, even though we have NS record support, um, we wouldn't want to necessarily expose that to the average user. Um, and so you can, uh, another configuration, lock down which record types you want to support in that or expand it if you want to. And, and supporting something that we don't have, we do support SRV now, uh, NAPTR, DS, there's a lot of record types, but there's also record types we don't ha have uh, support for right now. and it's. It's not, uh, it's not a stretch to add support for those already. We had somebody submit the NAPTR a year ago, so ago on their own. Okay, a uh, couple more questions. Um, can you stick around for a couple more minutes? We're almost done, but we have a couple more. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to run. stick around. Uh, that's okay. Happy to stick around. All right, well, there's a question from Richard. How much of the configuration of Vinyl DNS is done outside of the web interface? Um, so there is a, you know, you have your connectivity information to whatever database you're running, uh, your LDAP server, um, you, you know, we do, uh, you know, uh, symmetric cryptography in the system, that configuration item. There are, um, you know, like I said, right now, uh, manual, uh, there's a bunch of config flags in there and some, uh, a few other things like global ACL rules. I would say that once you set the system up, uh, by and large, we don't touch the config. Um, but there is a, there is a, I would say there's not an, a, a minimal amount of config, um, but it, there's also, uh, I've configured other systems and it's not, uh, it's not out of this world either. It's not the biggest configuration system that I would say. Okay. Uh, reverse IPv6. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, it does. Uh, the next question was, does it handle wildcard or dyma dynamic rev IPv6 entries? Is that the one? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, we do support IV IPv6. I didn't put them in a demo because I didn't want to fumble through it. <laughs> uh, and we do support wildcard as well. Um, certainly, they're come out of the box. Yeah, well, you did an impressive job of typing under pressure accurately. So uh, typing, <laughs> although you're, you make kind of heavy use of Cloudflare's uh, IP address, but anyhow. <laughs> um, <laughs> so there, uh, there have been a bunch of questions about validation, and uh, one question here um, from Richard: um, Does Vinyl DNS use NAMD check conf uh, or uh, NAMD check zone for bind, or is the validation something that you guys have written? So we've got 
Yeah, actually, because we're not building any zones with this right now, so we're not us utilizing um, us utilizing a a configuration building tool. This is more currently just allowing to do updates to current the zones that are currently available. Yeah, well, what we did was we went to the RFCs and we implemented all of our own validation for the record types that we do support. Um, not saying that there's holes in them, uh, but we do have a lot of tests around all that kind of stuff to make sure that the, that that we do a bunch of uh, validations before we go forward. But we, like Joe said, we didn't do anything like check comp or uh, anything like that, um, at least right now. Okay, um, it seems like there's a lot of interest in validation, and uh, I I can see that some organizations might have different validation rules. Um, uh, Richard is asking uh, whether or not um, Final DNS will load the DDNS zones. It can if you want it to. <laughs> um, it, it actually, it does. We we have one of our one of one of our largest DDNS zones um, being utilized, and it, it will sync. Um, I think currently we we have a sync timer where it will sync every X minutes or X you know hours, and to make sure all the data is up to date and synced from the back end to the front end. And, and, and vice versa. Okay, um, two more questions on validation. Um, do you validate the record contents? Yes, again, according to the RFCs as best as we can uh, before submitting, we do realize that there's some things that when you uh, submit a change to, to buy nine, it might reject it. Um, although we don't see that a whole lot, but it's possible that there could be additional backend uh, rejections in the backend, but we try our best to validate everything either through the portal or actually all validations are done in the API um, before being applied. So that's a question that I'd just like to ask a follow-up. If, if a bind rejects it, what, what does this come, does that rejection information flow back to the user through vinyl DNS? Yeah. So what happens is it'll, it'll be, it'll be saved in a database with a failed status. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then with a message as best as we can uh, interpret the results um, uh, of the failure. And so, you know, and like I mentioned before, the DNS requests are all or nothing, but it's par possible that there's a par partial failure that happens there. It's not even the bind nine server rejects it. You can imagine if there was some kind of network outage during that time. Uh, the back end for vinyl DNS will retry a um, hundred times um, with a, an exponential back off to try and do its best job of applying the DNS change. Um, but if, a, if it's flat out rejected, uh, we do detect that and then we actually do mark it as failed. Wow, a hundred times. That's uh, impressive. So last question. Uh, Neil's asking, um, do you do the same validation uh, when you're modifying a record as you do when you add it? Yes. Okay. All right. So uh, we reached the end of the questions. I uh, very much appreciate your patience with all these questions. And um, it was really a, a good demo. That's why people had so many questions. Uh, to me, it is it is stunning that you you have this scale for your internal DNS, and that you're not even using it yet for your customers. Um, uh, we did um, run the little poll, not too surprisingly, because I advertise this on Bind users, and most of the people who follow us are Bind users. Um, the people who responded to the poll, uh, seventy six percent are using Bind as the primary DNS system. Um, 64% said they might use vinyl DNS. 7% uh, said absolutely. Those might be your pals from Comcast. Um, <laughs> the poll is completely anonymous, so I can't tell if that's uh, the Comcast people voting there. Um, and uh, your last question, you wanted to know how many uh, different DNS providers are you using today? Um, most or about half of the uh, respondents said they're only using one DNS provider. Um, followed by two, three, and the, you know, one person says they're juggling more than three providers, which is impressive complexity. Um, yeah, for so sure. I, think I, we, I think we fall into that ladder bucket too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I'd really love to thank you because this has been a very useful webinar. I think uh, a lot of people are, are going to be interested in taking a further look at uh, Vinyl DNS, and I also want to thank Comcast for undertaking the additional effort to support other open source users in using this internal tool. Um, at ISC, we're very familiar with 
you know, how much work it is to support, um, you know, random people on the internet who want things. And uh, um, I just, uh, I really appreciate that you're doing it. Great. Yeah, thank you for you're welcome. Us. And thank you for having us. It was, uh, it, was, uh, it was great to, and you did a great job of moderating. Thank you very much. All right. Well, thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you, guys. Thanks.